Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to be talking about chronic gastrointestinal bloating. I'm going to go over some of the main concepts for the first 20 minutes and then I'll take questions uh, as they come in. So um, let's start with the basic concept. Now, if you, this is the first thing to really go over is if you eat the standard American diet, which is basically high sugar, high carb, high starch processed foods, it is absolutely expected to have abdominal bloating and distension and maldigestion. So let's just start with that. It, so that's one of the key things. So if someone is going out to a um, fast food place and eating a really, let's say go out for a pizza and a beer, or they go and get a huge thing of large fries and processed uh, fast food and lots of uh, you know sugar and a soda, it's pretty normal to have a uh, bad gut function. It's pretty normal to have bloating and distension. So I really want to just start with focusing the rest of the time really on people that are eating a healthy diet and they still have chronic bloating and, and maldigestion. So that's that's the key thing. Thank you for everyone that's joining us and saying hi. I um, appreciate the, I appreciate the um, thank yous and uh, also um, just the, what country you're from. So thank you. All right. Now, um, when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at people that are healthy and they have chronic, um, or let's just say not healthy because that's that can define many different ways, but a person is eating a reasonably healthy diet and they still have chronic bloating and chronic distension. They're not eating fast food every day. They're basically eating, you know, salads and vegetables and fruits and and healthy meats and so forth. And they have chronic bloating and distension and so forth. Let's talk about those patients. So that's really going to be my emphasis. Um, um, and with those patients, one of the things you have to realize is that. Whenever you look at the gastrointestinal tract, there's a saying that I always teach in, in, in my courses is you always have to clinically start north to south. And what that means is you have to first start with chewing and then swallowing and then going all the way down the gut. And the first thing that happens is the food gets digested in the stomach and the key part of that is hydrochloric acid release. And then it moves down into the small intestine, into the duodenum, and then you have to have pancreatic enzyme release to help digest the food, and then you have to have bile to help digest fat, and then you have to get proper absorption, and then you have proper intestinal motility to move the food across. And this function of releasing hydrochloric acid enzymes in the stomach, or pancreatic enzymes, or not having healthy gallbladder, or not having your intestinal tract have proper motility can all lead to chronic bloating and distension. So what I want to try to do in this, um, you know, this live Facebook uh, talk is try to help you dif differentiate what types of mechanisms may be causing chronic bloating and distension if you're suffering from that and just to understand the basic concepts. So one of the most common causes and the first place to really start is to look at digestive enzymes. And as a basic rule, you know, as a clinician, if I see a patient come in and say, listen, one of the things I'm complaining about is just I get bloated after I eat. I have several questions that I, 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 that I go through to try to figure out what may be causing it. So my first question is like, do you notice certain foods that may be causing bloating for you or is it all types of foods or is a portion is, is it based on portion size and these help you differentiate what the mechanism of their maldigestion could be so um, if a person has lots of bloating and distension and gas predominantly when they eat a protein rich meal like steak or eggs or just anything that's really rich in protein the first thing to think about is that they may actually need hydrochloric acid digestive enzymes and their stomach may not be producing hydrochloric acid. We'll talk about reasons why in a second, but we're just going to go through the, the list of things to think about when there's chronic bloating and distension. Now, other people may not have issues with protein that cause them to have chronic bloating, but for them it's starches. So for these people, it'll be anything that um, is... Um, like plant fibers, if they hit a big salad, they can get really bloated and distended. That's that's a that's more of a pancreatic enzyme issue. And for other people, it's fat. If they have anything with olive oil on it, if they have anything fried, they get really bloated and distended. And and those are related to the gallbladder. And then if everything they eat, just no matter what they eat, causes bloating and distension, that's typically an indication of a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And then if it's a portion size, like the amount of food they have to eat that causes uh, bloating and distension then you're starting to think about dysautonomia. So those are like the, the basic fundamental things to really think about if you're trying to figure out what's causing chronic bloating. So if it's protein-rich meals, then it could just be need for hydrochloric acid. If it's starches, uh, then it's pancreatic enzymes. If it's if it's maldigestion caused by eating anything that has is fat, like oil, olive oil or fried or greasy foods, then it's gallbladder. If it's all foods, then it could be something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. 
and if it's portion size, then we're looking at dysautonomia or um, dysfunctions in how the gut is processing food throughout the intestines. And so those are the the basic the basic concepts. Now, you, a person can absolutely have more than one um, mechanism. They could have all the mechanisms all at once. So all all types of things do happen. So let's talk about one of the most common ones, which is the need for hydrochloric acid. And you know, one of the things to understand about hydrochloric acid is, as food gets into the stomach, the most important step of digestion is uh, to actually produce hydrochloric acid. And just as a human species, as we get older, our production of hydrochloric acid levels do drop to some a certain percentage every year. So um, we do know just uh, as as we get older, you know, our bone density uh, can be impacted, our skin tone can be impacted. Um, so does our digestive enzyme output. So it's really common, especially as we get older, to have an uh, inability to produce enough hydrochloric acid. Um, and now other things can cause hydrochloric acid imbalances too. Um, for example, degeneration of the gut can do that. Uh, that can be a key factor. Infections with a bacteria called H. pylori can do that. Um, so the key thing is let's, let's talk about hydrochloric acid. So as food goes into your stomach, your body, your, your gastrointestinal tract releases hydrochloric acid. And that's important for a few things. It's important that it, um, for the process of breaking down protein because you need that acid to break down protein. But even more than that, it's really involved with also triggering reflexes in the small intestine so you can release pancreatic enzymes and you can also uh, initiate gallbladder contraction. So there has to be a change in pH from um, your food content going from your small from your stomach into your small intestine um, and the trigger is the, the pH of the acid release from hydrochloric acid to then trigger your gallbladder to release bile to break down fats and pancreatic enzymes. So, so if we do see, do see a patient that just has an intolerance to digesting all fats, we usually start with hydrochloric acid as a digestive enzyme supplement to see if it can really help them support their, their overall GI tract. Now hydrochloric acid, in addition to breaking down protein and then triggering the ref reflex in the small intestine to release pancreatic bile, uh, enzymes, I mean, pancreatic enzymes and bile from the gallbladder is also really important to neutralize the small intestine so you don't have any kind of bacterial overgrowths and also is really important for optimizing the pH of the gut so you have healthy amounts of microbiome diversity so it's like it's one of the most essential steps of digestion and when this system is not working it's really really hard to to get any change. Now people that also have hypochlorhydria tend to have really bad breath that comes along with the proteins that, if they're not digested, they putrefy and they cause uh, this really, you know, um, uh, protein putrefication breath, which is terrible. Uh, and uh, a lot of times, also, when they can't digest protein, they also may get kind of reflux or burning symptoms because when the proteins aren't digesting, they putrefy and they actually create. A, a more of an acidic environment that causes symptoms of sometimes gastric ulcers, but a lot of this is just related to hydrochloric acid. So if you're having issues with with just uh, healthy digestion, um, you know one of the first places to really start is just looking at hydrochloric acid. Now hydrochloric acid uh, is that just a supplement anyone can find on Amazon and health food store. You can also even consider things like apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar helps acidify the the stomach and help digest proteins, um, but it's not going to be as strong as taking hydrochloric acid. So that's like the first thing to, to really think about when you're seeing chronic bloating. Do you just need hydro, Do you just need to take some hydrochloric acid supplements? And if you if you decide to consider that for yourself, you know you start with one capsule, which you have a manufacturer you use, and then you kind of build up um, to see if. Uh, you find the right dose that gets rid of the bloating. And some people will start with one capsule and then go up to two or three, and that really what was works best for them to get rid of the bloating. And uh, you have to kind of personalize your, your dosage for that. Now, for other people, um, if they take hydrochloric acid or even apple cider vinegar, they get, they get extreme burning. And that's a clue that you have an underlying gastric ulcer. And if you have that, you definitely need to see your physician and get tested for things like H. pylori, which is a bacterial infection that can cause ongoing ulcers in the stomach. But the H. pylori organism also furs into the stomach lining and, and, and prevents hydrochloric acid release. So that's the key things that you really you know, want to understand when you're looking at um, hydrochloric acid issues. Now, people that have pancreatic enzyme issues, um, there's the ones... Um, that can't digest fiber and really just feel full if they eat anything that is uh, that contains a lot of starch or fiber, and uh, 
they also typically get very nausea they get lots of nausea they get lots of mucus in the stool and pancreatic enzyme deficiencies are very common but for those many of them are just secondary to not having enough hydrochloric acid because remember hydrochloric acid acidifies the um, small intestine, which then triggers the reflux to release uh, pancreatic enzymes. So pancreatic enzymes are like things like pepsin, bromelain, peptidases, um, lactases, and in the health food store, they're listed under pancreatic enzymes. Now, if you're looking at digestive enzyme supplements, some will contain HCL, some will only contain pancreatic enzymes, some will contain both. Um, a lot of times when people get have like hydrochloric acid deficiency or hydrochloric acid need, they get like a multi uh, enzyme product and they have just a little bit of HCL, not enough to really make a difference for them, and a lot of pancreatic enzymes, it doesn't work. So sometimes you just need to start with a high amount of hydrochloric acid first, find the dose that works for you, and then if you still have lingering symptoms, you may want to add in some pancreatic enzymes to see if that gets rid of any other symptoms that's there. Now, the third most common cause of bloating and, and the most overlooked are people that have, especially females, that have gallbladder uh, issues. And when you think of gallbladder issues, you know, most people are just thinking of gallstones and gallstone obstruction, but that's not really um, the main problem. The main problem is a phenomenon that's actually called sludge formation. And you can see this in an ultrasound uh, if you ever have your gallbladder assessed, if you have lots of gallbladder symptoms. And people that have gallbladder symptoms are really uh, um, suffering from inability to tolerate fats and greasy foods, they have lots of burping, they can't handle things like fish oils, and they just have this constant distension all the time. And, and sometimes the distension isn't always associated with their food intake because it may take two or three hours after you eat to really get bloated and distended when you have a gallbladder issue. So um, people that have gallbladder issues also tend to have referral pain when the gallbladder is contracting and under a lot of stress where they can have some upper back tightness right in between the shoulder blades and uh, they also can have stool that floats. People that have pancreatic issues or gallbladder issues can sometimes have floating stool. Those are all key factors where they may actually be a, a gallbladder issue. And it's not a gallstone, it's just gallbladder sludge. So the gallbladder releases bile and then bile is used to break down fats. But under various physiological conditions, um, there tends to be this thickening of the bile and that leads it to the sludge formation. So there is an efficient amount of bile release in the gallbladder to digest fats. And that sludge formation can eventually um, turn into gallstones and those gallstones may eventually cause the gallbladder obstruction which then will cause immediate uh, <laughs> acute symptoms that they'll probably want to go and get checked out at the hospital. But for a lot of people they never actually develop gallstone obstruction. They just get this thick bile substance that's there and um, like long-term hypothyroidism can cause gallstone formation. People that come from um, Middle Eastern, African uh, descent, Hispanic descent have higher risk. Uh, females have higher risk. Any type of uh, blood metabolic syndrome, o obesity increases gallbladder stone formation. And also they also found sedentary lifestyles really promote gallbladder uh, dysfunction as well. So when you're looking at uh, a common cause for just chronic bloating, it's really people that have these underlying sludge gallbladder formations. They're usually missed in the healthcare system because, you know, in, in the conventional healthcare model, they're really concerned about a gallstone obstruction, not really this so-called sludge formation that's taking place. And, uh, you know, some studies, when they look at the epidemiological uh, prevalence of gallbladder disease and gallstones, they found about 20% of Americans um, have some degree of gallstone issue. And it's pretty similar in other countries, like in Europe, um, it's also in the 20% 20 uh, 20 of the population as well. Okay. Now, if you have gallstone issues and gallbladder issues, then hydrochloric acid may have some benefit, pancreatic enzyme may have some benefit, but you really may need to do things to thin the bile. And thinning the bile, and by the way, if you have a gallbladder issue, you have to go off fats for an extended period of time. You've got to um, consider taking things like bile salts. You can find those over the counter. You've got to be very careful with taking bile salts. Bile salts help thin out the sludge, but if you take too much, it can cause increased bile movements and diarrhea, and that can be a major problem. So you've got to be very careful with that. And then things like um, beet root extract have been shown to help um, thin the bile, things like uh, 
milk thistle as a botanical dandelion root have been shown within the bile and usually taking a combination of those things are really important. They've also found coffee consumption really has a huge impact on thinning out the bile as well too. So coffee it has been shown to be very effective in, in, thinning, in thinning out uh, this uh, gallbladder sludge. So those are the key things to think about when you're looking at uh, mild digestion causing chronic bloating as far as digestive enzymes. So hydrochloric acid being the first one with protein intolerance, pancreatic enzyme being the second one with inability to handle starches and fibers. And then gallbladder issues really being a key issue with, with fats. Now, you again, you can have a person that's all three of them, and they may benefit from taking digestive enzymes that include hydrochloric acid, pancreatic enzymes, and then having to take things like lipase and compounds to help digest or to thin out their um, thick bile in their gallbladder. So those are the common, most common ones. Then you get into more chronic ones. And the next degree of difficulty or, or cr chronicity that is involved with um, chronic bloating and distension are people that suffer from something called SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And for these people, they just notice whatever they eat, they really just get bloating and distension. And um, what's actually happening in many of these patients is they have a condition called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And what happens in this mechanism is that bacteria that's found in the large intestine moves into the small intestine inappropriately. They call this you know, bacterial translocation. And that pattern can cause all this bacteria that is in the small intestine that shouldn't be there. And then when they get exposed to any kind of starch or sugar or compound, they end up getting significantly bloated and distended. And since there's a small amount of monosaccharides or, or uh, fructosaccharides in most meals people eat, I mean, they're so sensitive to get this, they get severe distension and bloating. And small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can be tested with uh, what's called a breath test, methane hydrogen breath test, where they can measure your breath levels of hydrogen, methane, and see if they get bacteria in a small intestine that are producing these gases. It's not a 100% accurate test because some of the bacteria in the small intestine release other gases besides methane and hydrogen. And there's also something called the FODMAP diet, uh, F-O-D-M-A-P, FODMAP diet, that was developed for people that have SIBO, which really removes all types of uh, the sugar, sugar compounds that really, and sugar and starch compounds that really feed this bacteria that shouldn't be in the small intestine. And uh, if you Google FODMAP diet, you'll see it's pretty standard. And a lot of times, if you have chronic bloating distension, you may want to just go on a FODMAP diet for a couple of weeks and see if it see if it helps you with your um, overall symptoms. And if it does, then you may actually have something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Then the question is, why do you have it? Well, you know, one of the things that we understand is that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth happens when the valve between the small and large intestine isn't working well and when the intestinal muscles are not contracting. And this can happen for a lot of reasons, but one of the most common reasons is chronic inflammation in the gut, like from a chronic inflammatory bowel disease or um, celiac disease, actually starts to degenerate the gastrointestinal nerve plexus. And then this leads to, uh, for many people, a permanent dysfunction in the gastrointestinal tract. And the other thing to understand is, just as the brain degenerates, the nerve plexus in the gut degenerate too. So when you have someone who's having severe inflammation in their gastrointestinal tract or have lots of risk factors for neurodegeneration, um, the gut nerve plexus called the enteric nervous system also degenerates, and that can also lead into this chronic small intestinal bacterial overgrowth issue. And then the, the other thing that's kind of related to this as it comes to um, this bloating and distension issue is... Um, dysautonomia. So some patients sometimes have traumatic brain injuries that then catch up with them a few years later and they lose this brain gut axis integration and they have a really hard time with uh, getting those smooth muscles and the valves to work well. So bacteria easily comes over to the gut and causes SIBO and they have uh, some issues with their brain gut axis actually causing release of pan enzymes as well. So sometimes you really have to treat the brain to really improve chronic bloating and distension and improve their, their health. So these are, you know, the basic concepts of mouth digestion. Now, of course, you should know any kind of food sensitivity you get exposed to can cause bloating and distension, unrelated digestive enzymes, most common ones, most common food sensitivities 
in the US and Europe are gluten, uh, milk protein, albumin, egg albumin, and soy, and soy protein. Those are the most common uh, triggers for people. So be aware of those food sensitivities. The, a lot of times food sensitivities turn on as you get older and you lose your immune tolerance. Um, and by the way, I've written, I've written lots of information about immune tolerance and food sensitivities on my website, drknews, drknews.com. And I also have um, an online program that teaches you how to improve your immune tolerance and what to do if you have lots of food sensitivities as well. So if you want to check that out, please go to Dr. K News and you can see all the information there. But there are people that, as they get older, they lose their immune tolerance and they start reacting to lots of food proteins and that'll, at that point, you have to improve your immune tolerance and basically um, try to remove those foods until you you can actually not react to them as, as, as seriously. And sometimes you can. Sometimes people just have ongoing celiac disease or the celiac disease turns on and you just have to be gluten-free to get rid of chronic bloating distension. There's also people that have chronic intestinal autoimmunity. They may not know it. Um, if you have one autoimmune disease, like if you already have Hashimoto's, or if you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's very likely you may also have autoimmunity happening in the gut. And when you have autoimmunity in the gut, that also starts to destroy the nerve plexus and you can end up with things like um, SIBO, and intestinal motility issues. So those are, you know, unfortunately the realities of what's what's out there. And then you you know you're trying to figure out what you can do with the, what the mechanism of the chronic cause of gas and bloating are. So those are some of the most uh, common things to think about. Now I would also say if you do have a motility issue or brain gut access issue, one of the biggest red flags that's happening in a clinical setting is if you're having difficulty swallowing foods. So, you know, sometimes I have patients come to my office and say, you know, please don't give me any, limit your supplements or if I can use a powder or oil as a nutraceutical, that'd be great because I really don't do well swallowing capsules. And that's especially important if they used to be able to swallow capsules and now they can't do it as the years have gone by. That's a major clue that the brain gut access or the intestinal motility system is not working. So those are key factors. Now, if someone eats really, really bad, um, they can also change the intestinal microbiome so they have more of these bacteria that tend to ferment and cause gas um, that lead to bloating and distension as well. So a diet very high in fiber, a diet rich in multiple um, fiber sources that help diversify the gut can also be key factors to get rid of bloating and distension. Now, I could also tell you that probably the least effective thing that helps get rid of bloating and distension are probiotics because probiotics aren't really addressing the underlying issue and they only have limited effects. What you really need to do is either increase your fiber intake or improve your enzyme physiology or look at your intestinal motility and so forth. And those are all the, the biggest factors. So I think I kind of got over the, I went over the, you know, the first 20 minutes, the key points of um, bloating and distension from most the most common mechanisms. There's obviously lots of other mechanisms, and you can always dig deeper to why someone has a gallbladder issue, or hydrochloric acid need. But, but I think for what we can accomplish in the live Facebook, uh, those are those are some really key concepts. So what I'd like to do is um, try to take some questions here, and my wonderful wife is helping me because I tend to not read questions accurately as I am trying to get my thoughts together. So. Uh, it's been really nice to have her help. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, Dee And by the way, my wife is Dr. Reyes. She's actually a doctor, and uh, she, she is uh, very competent in all these skills, and uh, she she knows how to. Sometimes she won't pick questions because, by the way, we, it's really hard for us to answer questions where it's like, how do I help me manage my case? And it's really impossible to manage a case when you're, you only have two sentences explaining it. I mean, that's not the key key it's not not optimal so um if we weren't able to get to your question it, it could also be because we can't answer a case study question we can only answer general concepts okay dr reyes okay dr krasian <laughs> <laughs> okay uh Didi, does supplementing with hcl cause you to produce less hcl does supplementing with hcl cause you to produce less hcl so yeah. this is an ongoing uh, debate whether if you take hcl your body doesn't make as much um well, I mean, your stomach is going to 
if, if it's working well and you're healthy, if you have HCL, it's just going to register. You don't need as much acidity release, so you're not going to make as much. The concept of like having your parietal cells complete atrophy if you take HCL, I think is a little too far stretched. So uh, I don't think it's going to be much of an issue for for most people. Now, sometimes if you're constantly taking HCL and you and then you stop, you may have uh, a day or a meal or two where your body has to catch up with it, but it's not going to be like an ongoing thing or cause atrophy of your gut if you're just taking some digestive enzymes. So, um, you know, and you know, sometimes uh, you may want to increase your HCL dosage too, just uh, if you're traveling. I know, like when our family travels and we go to uh, a new culture, a new environment. We'll sometimes just take HCL because it helps acidify the gut, which helps neutralize pathogens as too or bacteria that our guts are not used to. Um, even though they're bacteria that are tolerable by the people in the, in, the, in the region that they're used to eating it, for us going to new regions, some of those bacterial species uh, may uh, have their impact on us. So I so we'll also take HCL just when we travel all the time to help support it. But I don't think taking HCL is going to cause any significant physiological loss where you can't make your own. Okay. okay. Next one. Um, Cassia, I took HCL in the past and it caused burning. Yes. Does this mean I don't need it? If you took HCL in the past and it caused burning, it means you have a gastric ulcer or you have thinning of your gastrointestinal tract. You shouldn't have any burning taking HCL unless you have some thinning of the gastrointestinal lining. The amount of HCL you're taking with the supplement is is, is should never lead to burning. So you may have some inflammatory issues in your stomach lining already, you may want to heal your stomach lining. Um, you know, one of the most uh, effective compounds to heal stomach lining with some pretty good research behind it is uh, DGL, deglycerized licorice. So when you take a look at licorice, licorice has flavonoids that really help the healing of the gut, but they also have a compound called glyceriza, which can increase your blood pressure. So they made a version of licorice called deglycerized licorice, uh, deglycerized licorice, DGL, that can just help heal the lining of the stomach. So if you really do have intolerance to hydrochloric acid because it causes burning, it really suggests that you may actually have um, some gastric lining thinning or maybe some gastric ulcers. And you should definitely be checked out for H. pylori infections. H. pylori is the most common infection worldwide. And uh, when you get it, it, it can start irritating, causing inflammation in the gut. And the ones that are most at risk for the complications of it and the risk factors for it, which is gastric cancer. And um, actually, the other key thing with chronic H. pylori is, is also cardiovascular disease. There's several thousand papers that show H. pylori pathogens in the gut furrow into the vascular endothelium and cause destruction. So H. pylori is kind of like a bacteria that has been shown clearly to cause um, blood vessel disease and these are most concerning for people that have no symptoms of gastric ulcers and it usually doesn't show up until they take some HCL. So if you have burning taking hydrochloric acid, you should definitely look at taking things like deglycerized licorice, healing your gut, checking for H. pylori, and going down that route. Okay, next question. Okay, Cindy, how much apple cider vinegar should you take and when? So if you want to see if apple cider vinegar helps your digestion because it helps acidify your stomach, you can start with like t uh, two tablespoons and go up to like a quarter, quarter of a cup and see see how it works for you. If you are concerned about having burning or reflux, you might just want to start with two tablespoons and see if that works. For some people, they'll need to drink more than that, maybe a quarter of a cup to really get the best digestive effects from it. And if you notice that the apple cider vinegar does help you digest, but you want to do something more, then the next step would be to step up from apple cider vinegar to actual hydrochloric acid um, supplementation. Okay. Okay, next question. And Joanne, the best time to take HCL, before, during, or after meals? So that's a good question. The question that comes up is, what's the best time to take HCL? Is it before, during, or after meals? And you can also say that with any with pancreatic enzymes as well. So what I found working with patients in my practice is to let them experiment. Because people have different uh, transit times and different motility times, so you can you can try taking HCL like a few minutes before your meal comes, before you eat. You can try taking it during your meal, or you can try taking it five or ten minutes after you eat, and then you can kind of determine which is the best one for you. For most people, taking it with their meal is the easiest way to do it, and it seems to work great. But uh, 
you know, you may notice a better 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 uh, response to it if you take it bef- slightly before you eat or right at, or a few minutes, 10, 15 minutes after you eat. So there is some uniqueness and individuality with that. All all of them will work. They will all help you acidify your gut and digest your food. So you can just experiment see what works best for you. Okay. Okay. Um, Monica, do you treat SIBO first or mold toxicity first if positive on a mycotox test? We'll so first. the question is, do you, if, if a person has SIBO and mold reactions, myotoxins, which do you treat mm-hmm. first? So this is the really the battle when it comes to a novice with an experienced clinician. Because if you go see a functional medicine practitioner or someone who, you know, looks at uh, these different types of mechanisms, um, lifestyle, dietary nutrition mechanisms, if you get enough testing done, you're going to come up with a whole list of things that's wrong. Um, That's just the fact. The question is, like, which one do you treat in order? And that is where really the skill set comes in between someone that is experienced in clinic in clinical practice, someone that isn't. People that aren't experienced in clinical practice will say things like, always treat the gut first. Well, that might not be the best approach. And for some people and for many people, that's not the best approach. Sometimes there are things that actually are causing the, the gut imbalance. So you have to, to look at those mechanisms. So I can't tell you which you should treat first because it's not, it's not a rule. So there are lots of many other variables that are involved that are involved with the, where you start. So, um, for example, if you're living in a building that's chronically making you sick, chronically making you inflamed, you may need to get it out of that environment to have a chance to actually reduce your inflammation so you can fix your gut. Um, on the other hand, your gut imbalance may be causing you to lose your tolerance, which now makes you much more reactive to the mold environment you're in. So, or you may do a combination approach. So there is not, there isn't a set rule, and uh, um, that's really the best way. I could try to answer your question in uh, in a setting like this. Okay. Next question. I missed the name. Kilicon? I'm not sure. Okay. If SIBO, if the SIBO breath test is not accurate, which test is, and which food allergy test is recommended? Cyrex, Alcat. Okay. First question. If the SIBO breath test is not accurate, then which one is? Mm-hmm. So the SIBO breath test is accurate if you are producing bacteria that produces m- methane or hydrogen. And for the most part, um, the specificity and sensitivity is, is, is good. It's not perfect, but it's good. So it is a good test. It's just there are some people that have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that the bacterial species they have in their gut are releasing gases beyond methane and hydrogen. So that's where you can have some diagnoses missed. So this is why sometimes just doing a FODMAP diet for two weeks will really be a big clue to you if you actually are suffering from this uh, SIBO pattern. The second part of the question was, what kind of food sensitivity do I recommend best? Um, what food allergy test is recommended? Cyrex, Alcat. Cyre- Cyrex, Alcat. So, uh, of course, I personally love Cyrex. I use them in my practice. I work with them. I consult with them. And I like them because they do ELISA uh, gold standard testing and they do duplicate testing. So um, that's my preference. As a commercial lab, I use Cyrex. Um, but... More important than commercial lab preference, there's a big difference between ALCAT testing and what everyone else is doing. So the the gold standard test to measure food sensitivity tests is is really um, called ELISA, uh, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. The other form of testing, like ALCAT, they're doing what's called a cell-mediated test. And cell-mediated tests are terrible. They have very low specificity. They have very low sensitivity. The reproducibility is is, is 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 not good. It's actually banned as a test in many states. Um, everyone in the world uh, of uh, immunology, not lab marketing, or just in shock that people are using it. And what the cell media test will do, like things like ALCAT, which use cell media test, is they basically take a um, antigen presenting cell to see if food protein causes it to swell. And if it does, then they suggest that's a food sensitivity. But that is such an inaccurate way to look at a reaction for food. You really need to see the clear antibody. Um, and, uh, you know, when they've actually looked at studies comparing uh, cell media testing to ELISA, there's no comparison. So I think a lot of the labs that are doing cell mediated testing for food sensitivity are. Um, 
really doing a really fantastic marketing campaign, but they're, but they're not following what's the gold standard, which is ELISA testing, which is very, very high specificity, sensitivity, and reproducibility. Uh, in my immune tolerance program, I actually have a whole section on all the different mechanisms, and I go into much detail about how these different lab tests work. So that's also something um, that's included in the immune tolerance program, if you're interested in that. Okay, next question. Okay. Um, Projectica? That's pretty. Is the baking soda test accurate to determine uh, low stomach acid? Is the baking soda test accurate to, to determine low stomach acid? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not sure of any studies that have ever been done with the baking soda test. It's kind of one of the things that people do out there where you alkalize the gut and then you see how quickly you can, you can get responsive again. Now, if you did um, a gastric Heilenberg test where you swallow a capsule and then take a neutralizing soda like baking soda and they can actually measure your pH response against it, that is the gold standard. That is very, very accurate. Um, but, you know, not many people swallow a capsule that then measures pH and then take baking soda to determine their acidity, but that is the gold standard test. So in that version, it is very accurate. Someone asked about that on the test. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> Phil, what's your take on celery juice? Phil, what's my take on celery juice? <laughs> my, my take on celery juice is, wow, it's become really popular. <laughs> um, I haven't read... The source of celery juice. I have a friend, family friend, that <laughs> just tells me that they're doing it and they're juicing with all the. I mean, if you're doing it, good for you. Um, and it, you know, celery juice has lots of antioxidants. It, uh, if you're on it, it can. If you're doing it, especially in a, a long-term fasting state, it can really help change your microbiome. Uh, I don't know if it's as impressive as <laughs> any other type of vegetable to be juicing. I know there's some theories behind it, but. Uh, it's not a bad thing if you want to if you want to juice with celery juice and fast while you're juicing with celery juice. I think you have some nice health benefits from it. So that's that's as far as I can answer that question. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, Pia, what is always in your protocol for dysautonomia? What is always my protocol for dysautonomia? Nothing. There's nothing always in my protocol for any condition. Um, but dysautonomia is a complex condition. So dysautonomia, meaning give a difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic, can be caused by many different pathways. So, you know, for me, if I have a dysautonomia patient, it will it will literally take me um, three, three and a half hour neurological exam, not even talking about the basic physical exam, to try to pinpoint what areas of the brain are involved causing dysautonomia. Any injury to the brain in different regions can fire into autonomic centers and cause dysregulation. So, and then the question is, what's causing that? So there is there is no conventional, there's no treatment approach for dysautonomia. I can say I always do. Now, um, that's that's far as like uh, trying to treat dysautonomia. Now, the side effects of dysautonomia, there's some general things you can do. For the side effects of dysautonomia, for example, if you can't control your autonomic function where you're more in a sympathetic response, which your, means your heart rate is up, your eyes are dilated, your heart rate goes all over the place. It, that's more dominant in your parasympathetic response, like digesting and producing enzymes. Then, you know, in, until that gets figured out or treated, and sometimes the injuries are so significant you can't treat it, you probably should take digestive enzymes to compensate for your dysautonomia. You should probably, um, you know, take things like probiotics, and things like short-chain fatty acids and things like butyrate to really help your microbiome environment. Um, and you just, if you have true dysautonomia, you know, you're, you're going to have gall digestive issues and uh, enzyme release issues and motility issues. So you're just going to have to do whatever you can to improve your digestive function, um, even though you won't be able to fix your digestion until your dysautonomia um, gets treated. So you so in some sense, you're just going to at least do some general approaches to deal with the side effects of having a dysautonomic pattern by improving gut function best you can. Okay, next question. Okay, Siora, she, so she's saying the capsules are so big to swallow, she wants to make a chocolate probiotic for her kids using Enterobite. Is the Apex Enterobite heat sensitive? If she breaks the capsules up and puts it into melted chocolate, it's cooling down to harden. Would that, would it, would I don't, I, to be honest with you, I don't know if short chain fatty acids are heat sensitive. So I don't know if you melt down <laughs> terabyte to uh, chocolate, it would work. Um, I don't know. This is a funny question. I can't answer it. Okay. You're going to have to let us know. <laughs> okay. What's the biggest difference between SIBO and Candida? 
What's the difference between SIBO and candida? So SIBO is a bacterial overgrowth um, that takes place when bacteria from the large intestine moves to the small intestine. And candida overgrowth is different. Candida overgrowth is a, a, a yeast overgrowth uh, itself, not a bacterial translocation. And you know, candida is a normal part of our gastrointestinal tract. And if you do what's called a gastrointestinal mycology test, they can measure the growth or the amount of candida. And you can see these overgrowth patterns of candida. And, um, you know, those happen when there's something really impacting the gastrointestinal immune system. And then when the gastrointestinal immune system is, is not healthy, if you have a diet very high in sugar and starch, or if you've been on a high dose of antibiotics for a very long time that's wiped out the healthy bacteria in the gut that then compromises the immune system, then you can get these these kind of yeast candida patterns that take place. So um, candida patterns are, are a combination of something that compromises the gut microbiome, which then impacts gut immunity, like heavy antibiotics, bad diet, heavy stress, a uh, combination of all those things at once. And then when the candida species has an overgrowth in the gut, they'll, anytime you have too much sugar or starch, they feed off it and cause bloating and distension and, and, and lots of other diverse symptoms. And in those cases, you just basically have to go off all sugar and, and starch and fruit and take some natural antifungal compounds um, like... Uh, uh, Grapeseed, uh, grapeseed extract is one of them. You can take um, olive leaf extract. You can take, um, you know, lots of uh, various antibacterial, uh, natural anti-yeast uh, com common uh, compounds to deal with that as you work on your diet. Now, um, SIBO is totally different. SIBO is the intestinal motility system is not working and the valve causes this bacterial overgrowth. And then some people get a combination of both. So that's the difference between those two. Okay. John Lynn, how does um, butyrate help the gut? How does butyrate help the gut? Mm -hmm. So butyrate, which, which is a short chain fatty acid, uh, helps the gut in multiple ways. But let me, so butyrate is something you can take as a digestive supplement or you can eat fiber, which gets converted into butyrate. So if you take, if you have a high fibrous uh, diet, like lots of different vegetables in your diet, you actually will make your own butyrate. Some people actually need to take butyrate to really get the benefits. And um, the way butyrate works is that butyrate is a fuel source to healthy bacteria in your gut to help them grow. So it's basically the primary fuel for the gut. And butyrate also binds to receptors in the gut called G-coupled proteins. And they control blood sugar management, which is fascinating in the diabetes research. And uh, butyrate also activates what are called regulatory T cells in the gut. And they've actually shown to uh, help uh, calm down intestinal inflammation and even systemic autoimmune responses in some studies. And butyrate is one of the few things that's actually been shown to help regenerate the, the tight junctions of the intestinal tract. Um, we talk about all these things in the immune tolerance program because one of the most important things to do when you have uh, loss of food sensitivities and a bad gut is to uh, really improve your gut immune tolerance. And people that have chronic candida growth, for example, they really need to improve their immune tolerance to, to calm that whole thing down. And one of the key things we talk about in that program is is taking butyrate, and and uh, and uh, it's, it's essential to make a big change there. Okay. Kind of on that same vein. Meg asks, then do SIBO and candida protocols overlap? SIBO and candida protocols overlap in the sense that you have to give off sugars and starches. Um, but with an actual candida issue, you probably have to take natural anti-yeast compounds to, to really uh, get it under control. Okay. And then um, what is the test for candida? So there's different types of tests for candida. Um, you can measure candida in a stool, that's just a comprehensive digestive of stool analysis. They have an area of the test which they call mycology, and mycology checks for the the amount of bacterial yeast species that they find in a stool sample, and that's the way you check for it as far as what's actually happened in the gut. And then candida can actually get into the bloodstream, especially if you have intestinal permeability and have the tight junctions that break down, and that, that is a whole different beast. And that can be measured with antibodies in the blood. And even your conventional labs like Quest and LabCorp do measure that. And there are some, you know, there's a difference between candida too. You could have a, 
unhealthy gut environment have some candida overgrowth patterns that which then make you very sensitive to sugar um, and and starches to get bloating and distended. But if your tight junctions are also broken, then you can get candida levels in the in the in the bloodstream, and then those candida levels in the bloodstream create an inflammatory reaction throughout the body, and that's when people with candida syndrome really really have a problem. So in those cases, you got to remove the candida, you got to improve the tight junctions, you got to improve immune tolerance, the gut, and really um, go down that route. Okay. okay. Next question. Um, sure. If. Oops. Sorry. Um. Does no, 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 I'm sorry. Okay, from Sean. How can one determine if they have permanent parietal cell damage from years of undiagnosed celiac disease? Will these individuals require biotin HCL forever? So how can you determine if you have on like chronic parietal cell permanent damage? Parietal damage, yeah. From uh, years. Of from years. Diagnosed celiac. From that, that, okay. So there, there really isn't a, like a standard test you go. To, to use to determine if your gut plexus is destroyed, if your prior cells aren't working. You can do a thing like a gastric Heidelberg test to see what your degree of hydrochloric acid production is. But your biggest clue is that you've had a chronic inflammatory condition for, for many, many years and your gut's not working. They do have motility studies that are used in conventional medicine. That's probably your best accurate test, but you have to have severe loss of intestinal tract, uh, nerve enteric plexus to show that. So... Um, your gastroenterologist can order an uh, intestinal motility test to determine if you have some compromise of the nerve plexus of your gut, compare you to a normal population for your age group, and determine if you've that there's some issues there. Um, and then you can have to do a gastric Hollenberg test to, to get a clue of what's happening with your parietal cell function where you swallow a capsule and then they uh, give you an alkalizing solution to see how long it takes for your stomach to get acidic enough. So those would be the two um, standard test to, to evaluate those. Okay, Nancy. In type 2 diabetic patients, what can I offer to support gut motility, with which is often, um, I think I said an issue. Oh, type 2 diabetic patients, what can I offer to support their gut motility, which is often an issue? So with type 2 diabetes patients, um, if their gut motility is an issue, you got to be really concerned. Because, you know, type 2 diabetes, especially uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, where you have elevated HbA1c, especially if the levels are above 7.4, just as, uh, you know, when you when you have these elevated blood sugar levels, they end up becoming gly glycosylated end products, which are these free radicals. So if you can't get your glucose into your cells, free radicals attack them, and they make them a much more reactive free radical, which then destroys most uh, commonly neurons. And everyone's used to understanding that, um, you know, neurons that can cause diabetic neuropathies when they get really extreme, but they can also cause degeneration of the enteric nerve plexus. So if you're working with a lot of diabetic patients, um, you, you could be dealing with a intestinal uh, degeneration from those advanced glycolated end products. And there is literature that shows diabetics do have some damage and injury to their nerve plexus in their gut. At the end of the day, you're going to try to calm down their diabetes, get their HBA and C levels down so you can stop that progression. You might need to give them enzymes and things to improve their gut function in the time. And then one of the things I talk about in my brain book, I wrote a book on the brain called um, Why Isn't My Brain Working? And I have a chapter on the brain-gut access and the gut-brain access. And I talk about sometimes you'll have to have do exercises to activate the vagus so gargling with water where you take water and just gargle with it activates the palatine muscles that fires into your gut to get that vagal system moving um this list of other things in the book that we talk about that's the most common easy approach to use to support the to support that pathway but then you so you want to control the diabetes give them enzymes to improve their microbiome and their overall health and things like butyrate improve their immune tolerance their gut and then do some vagal gargling exercises to see if you can activate those smooth muscles in the gut um, to, through that exercise. Okay, so Jonalyn, can GERD cause SIBO? Can, yes, Gas, well, can GERD cause SIBO, GERD being gastroesophageal reflux disease. So gastroesophageal reflux disease is typically associated with low hydrochloric acid, and low hydrochloric acid is a mechanism that can cause SIBO. It's not a common one, but it can. So people that have gastroesophageal reflux disease have burning in their stomach, and they have this acid reflux come up up their um, esophagus, which causes that severe burning. 
And that's not necessarily from being low in hydrochloric acid. That's that's typically from having protein putrefaction causing that increased burning and symptoms. For those patients, um, what you may want to do is just take some apple cider vinegar and see if it doesn't burn you. If it doesn't burn you, you may get rid of your reflux and your SIBO just by taking some hydrochloric acid. If it does burn you, you may need to heal your stomach lining with things like DGL and uh, go on an anti-ulcer diet, um, go off anti, basically go off pro-inflammatory foods for your diet, like wheat, dairy, gluten, soy, eggs, and and really uh, see if you can heal your stomach lining. And if you can't heal your stomach lining and then take HCL, you should be able to get rid of the side effect, which can be SIBO. So you can get you can get bacterial overgrowth that goes from the large intestine to the small intestine, not just from destruction of the gut plexus of the nerves, but you can get it if you can't neutralize your small intestine through hydrochloric acid release from the stomach. Okay. Um, so, um, what? Oh, Phil asked. Okay. Can you? Sorry. Is no. it okay to drink caffeine on a daily basis? Is it okay to drink caffeine on a daily basis? Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, listen, so caffeine has lots of health benefits. Um, the flavonoids in coffee have very powerful neuroprotective effects. Um, the flavonoids in coffee can really help with just general inflammation, but you definitely cannot take coffee, which is a stimulant. If you cannot handle stimulants, if, for example, your physiological adrenal function is really low, a stimulant would be too much for you. There's some people that are slow metabolizers or caffeine. If they drink caffeine, they get wired. They can't take it. And there's people that have high blood pressure, hypertension. They can't drink coffee. But if you don't have those issues with stimulants and uh, you don't have high blood pressure, studies have actually shown that if you if you look at population where they have uh, that are coffee consumers, they have decreased risk of Parkinson's disease and have decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease, and has a very powerful neuroprotection uh, response. Just like the benefits of people that drink tea daily, that the antioxidants and flavonoids in tea are, are very um, protective when they're done regularly and taken regularly. Okay, um, Joanne, what helps regenerate the nerves in the gut, and can stem cells help? Okay. What helps regenerate the nerve lines? So it's the nerve you may not be able to regenerate the nerves that are totally injured, but what you can do is nerves that are still healthy, they can branch over dead ones and they can grow. So the, the key thing with the nervous system is you can't get plasticity. So the only way to get plasticity in the gut is to, to, to really activate the gut by doing vagal exercises. So gargling is one of the most common ones. Um, another common one, another one you can use is you can do a coffee enema. Uh, the coffee enema is not there to detox or anything like that when you're trying to support uh, nerve activity in the gut. You basically want to get the caffeine into the large in, into the colon, to the large intestine. And then the caffeine is a stimulant to what are called acetylcholine nicotinic receptors in smooth muscles of the gut. And they cause those smooth muscles in the gut to contract. And when they contract, if you've ever done a coffee enema, you'll have the sense of having to, you know, to have a bowel movement. And the key thing is to activate this brain gut access is to actually hold that content for as long as you can. It's kind of like, I call it bowel planking, like you're planking, like you should be shaking like you're planking. Uh, and, and then that type of activity actually fires your brain pontine vagal pathway to suppress smooth muscle reflexes that are being triggered by the caffeine. And that can help get that nerve plexus going. So gargling and doing... Um, coffee enemas with with suppression of bowel movements or ways to help get those nerve fibers in the gut to develop plasticity and uh, get some connectivity and function back as far as stem cells go you know th there's there's i mean stem cells have a lot to a lot a lot of uh, research that needs to be conducted and uh, i don't i don't know if any of the current stem cell strategies would have any significant impact in changing gut uh, plexus function okay tilly asks could brain neurodegeneration be the cause of low saliva production? How would you treat that? Thanks. Could brain degeneration be a cause of low saliva production? Production, yes. Mm -hmm. So when people start to produce less saliva, there's two main things you're thinking about, autoimmunity and, and neurodegeneration. So saliva, and so mm -hmm. when you look at the brain stem, do you have a group of uh, uh, nuclei called brachial arch derivatives? And these brachial arch derivatives are 
cranial nerve 7, 9, and 10. And cranial nerve 7 is involved with tearing and nasal secretions and saliva production. 9 is involved with saliva production and 10 is involved with swallowing. But this area of the brainstem tends to degenerate together. Um, and when one part of this nuclei gets de loses function, the other ones lose function because they're what they call in neurology a phylogenetic homologue, that they um, have connections to each other, that they integrate into each other. So sometimes people start to get develop things like Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease where they have protein aggregates like tau protein or alpha synuclein that builds up in these brainstem centers, and they lose their ability to produce saliva, they have a hard time swallowing, they have chronic constipation and blowing bloating. So that's a neurodegenerative disease. And those are all progressive, um, unfortunately. Now, another common reason that people have law, uh, saliva issues is they have an autoimmune response. And there are specific autoimmune reactions against uh, saliva glands that then cause them to produce less saliva. You see this with sh some of the connective tissue diseases like Sjogren's disease or lupus. They have the specific uh, autoimmune reaction against these glands. They haven't been able to find the serum antibody marker to identify that in a lab test. They just know when they look at the tissues um, and do histology studies that there's an autoimmune reaction happening there. So they're common in autoimmunity. The way to distinguish those two apart is that if it's neurodegeneration, you're going to see symptoms associated with neurodegeneration with it, like cognitive decline or stiffness or rigidity with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And then not only do they have issues with saliva production, but they have the actual problem of swallowing and have constant constipation. If you see constant constipation and swallowing issues, it's more likely the brain. If they have a history of autoimmunity and they just can't produce saliva, but they can digest fine and have normal bowel movements, then it's most likely an autoimmune response against the salivary glands. Okay, Dee Dee. Does diverticulitis play a part in bloating and distension? Yes, yeah, so diverticulitis will definitely play a role in bloating and distension because it's an inflammatory condition of the gut. And if you have diverticulitis, you really need to improve your gut environment and your gut health, which improves, which involves having proper digestion, having healthy microbiome, having healthy digestion, and getting rid of any inflammatory um, food protein triggers that you may have a unique reaction to. Okay, Mar um, Mariam. Is there a relationship between increasing zinc and the body in the body to core to help increase HCL? Dr. Albert Mensa mentioned low zinc is the reason for low HCL. Yeah, I've heard that too. You know, the thing is, like, if you have low HCL, you need zinc. Um, that's that's the theoretical thing. Like, I can tell you, or twenty years of practice, I've never seen HCL levels go up giving anyone zinc. Um, it looks good on textbook. If you don't actually really clinically practice, I don't think I think uh, you can make that assumption. But I've never just given a patient zinc and seen their HCL symptoms go away. So I think it's more complicated than that. I've seen HCL issues go away when people were gluten sensitive and they go off gluten. I've seen HCL symptoms go away when people had an H. pylori infection and they got treated. I see HCL symptoms go away when um, people um, start to overall improve their diet and health so they're not constantly trying to neutralize their uh, the gut with, with acid. So I don't know. I think it's one of those it's one of those folklore theoretical things in the world of nutrition because if you look at a book you see zinc is involved with it, but it's pretty rare you have such a like if you just take zinc you'll get fixed you'll fix HCL. Okay. Um John can someone with acid reflux take HCL? Can someone with the acid reflux take HCL? So yes and no. Uh, if you have acid reflux, um, you, what you probably should do is just take a couple, like a tablespoon or two of apple cider vinegar and see if it causes burning. If it doesn't cause burning, you may then try HCL, and that may rid, get rid of your reflux altogether because you just may not be able to digest proteins well, and that causes the symptoms of acid reflux. However, if it does cause burning, then you definitely, if apple cider vinegar doesn't cause burning, um, if it does cause burning, definitely don't take HCL. You're going to need to heal your stomach lining first and 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 to go, go go under that pathway. Okay, Shona, what do you think of peptide therapy for the gut? What do I think about peptide therapy for the gut? Um, there's different peptides and that can be used. Um, I think it's hit or miss. I don't think that uh, everyone responds to peptide therapy. And you definitely can also trigger people to have an adverse reaction. So I don't have a strong feeling for or against it. Okay. Um, funny. 
Sean, what are the three top reasons for low stomach acid and are all treated the same way? Top three reasons for low stomach acid. Yeah. Okay. This is, a, this is a good question to end our hour with. Okay. okay. Number one. Number one reason people have low hydrochloric acid is that they have an H. pylori infection. <laughs> it's the most common bacterial infection in the world. It's a common cause of, of it because the bacteria lining comes in and, and froze into lining the stomach and you can't, you can't get rid of it. The number two reason people have low HCL is really because they're constantly eating foods that are inflammatory. And hydrochloric acid also gets triggered during inflammatory conditions and helps neutralize the abnormal pH that inflammatory reactions cause. So a lot of times you have people have HCL need and it, it, they they take it, they get through their bloating distension, they cough, they have to take it, and they finally go, you know what, I, I can't I can't do milk. And they actually get off milk and they have no more need for HCL. So sometimes just it's just in an inflammatory food protein. And then the third cause for chronic HCL need uh, for some people, um, it really is just aging, um, especially in the elderly population. You know, we, we end up having some degeneration of our cells as we get older, and parietal cells are a common one. So once you start to get past age 60, 70, you're, you're going to not have as many parietal cells just by how our system doesn't regenerate tissues as much as we age. Um, and aging would be the third most common one. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, for for joining the session on um, some of the key concepts of floating and, and uh, distension. Um, if I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry, but I hope uh, you found something valuable, and we'll hope to have you join us for our next uh, talk. Thank you.